Hello, and thanks for loading up the latest installment of the World Extreme Medicine podcast, a natural home for people with restless and adventurous minds. I'm your host, Jobbing GP and WEM Medical Director, Will Duffin. As extreme medics, our involvement in expeditions normally begins long before anyone boards a plane to a remote corner of the planet. We're often involved upstream in assessing an individual's fitness and indeed aptitude for a given environment, weighing up pre-existing conditions, anticipating medical risks, and this can be a really tricky area. So to shed some light on this, I'm talking today to Dr. Kent Haworth, who is a consultant occupational medicine physician. He's passionate about occupational medicine and its application to maximum benefit in real world working environments. Kent originally trained as a GP, a family physician, in 1998 before retraining in occupational medicine to pursue his interest in dive medicine. He went on to work as a GP and occupational physician in the British Army and the Royal Navy, gaining additional experience in aviation medicine in a military career spanning 29 years. And in addition to being an integral part of military operations, Kent's also provided medical cover for uh, TV and film projects, including the, the coldest race on earth with James Cracknell. And his expedition work has taken him to places like Egypt, Libya, Singapore, and Myanmar. Kent's just been out in Jeddah for the past two years, working at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, which is a private research university in, in Saudi Arabia. And he just moved back to the UK, living now in, in West Sussex. And he's, <laughs> Kent's just completed his 14-day mandatory quarantine period. So, Kent, welcome to WENCAST, and how does it feel to be free? It, it feels wonderful to be free. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to to uh, join you today. Um, it is, yeah, it is great to be out of quarantine. Very necessary um, public health measure, of course. I'm very happy to, um, to 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 comply with that fully. Uh, it has been a long ten days, um, and uh, you know, being being able to, to get out and about yesterday was was a real boon. So I've got a week now uh, before I start um, uh, work again, and I'm going to try and make the most of it. Get as much fresh air in the in the uh, the cold and um, and and bright weather that we're seeing now in West Sussex. It's great. Yeah, oh, it's not nice being cooped up indoors. But you of all people understand the reasons why. So that's nice. And you've had a really interesting career. Such, such breadth to what you've done. And, and as you know, at World Extreme Met and a lot of our courses we talk about uh, evaluating participants and pre-existing conditions. And we just thought it would be great to have your insights as someone with real expertise in this area. Um, so yeah, we, we're really pleased to, to, to have you uh, on the on the webcast. Now, the very specialty areas that you've, you've kind of uh, dabbled in over the years uh, include mm -hmm. diving, aviation, offshore, oil and gas expeditions. Um, what would be really helpful to start with, Kent, is could you give us just some some core principles of how you as an occupational health physician approach evaluating someone pre-departure, pre-deployment? You know, what, what are the key uh, parts of, the, of that encounter that you have with someone? Absolutely. Um, uh, and just listening to your to your intro um, before, Will, um, you, you speak uh, about the importance of, of preparation. Um, and, and if I were to say anything about preparing uh, or the pre preparatory phase of of expeditions or, or uh, any any remote ventures um, or anything indeed uh, where you're taken uh, to um, uh, you know outside of the um, immediate medical care um, system that, that that we enjoy uh, in 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 the UK generally is it's all about preparation um, assessing somebody's suitability to uh, work uh, in a in any given environment um, it can be a real challenge um, now of course you're looking at specialty areas like diving or aviation oil and gas you benefit from from having 
um, a, a, uh, a rule book, um, a, a book of medical standards that you can refer to. And those, those areas in particular that I've spoken about um, ha- have grown up as subspecialties within occupational medicine. And there are um, a, a number of very notable, very eminent um, physicians and other allied health, healthcare care um, workers in in those in those occupations um, who who you can you can go to for 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 a lot of ad- advice and guidance but it's in the areas where you may not enjoy uh, a a rule book a book of medical standards or where the environment that individuals are entering um, is not so mainstream um, it's where the principles of occupational medicine really really come in and um, Occupational medicine is 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 a a, a mainstream specialty. Uh, it's gaining a greater and greater prominence both here and 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 overseas. Um, but it's all about uh, that the interface between work and health and how work affects health and how health affects work um, in a uh, positive, neutral, or unfortunately sometimes negative way. And it's it's understanding that interface and working uh, towards um, uh, mapping the individual uh, to the workspace or, or more properly the workspace to the individual, making sure that there is a good fit there um, and there are there are uh, well-established means of, of of trying to make that work where possible. Um, that's that's where if if that's the underlying principle of 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 preparing people to to enter these uh, you know these these environments. You're looking at the pre um, really big big area that that one needs to consider in order to optimize um, the outcomes, both on a personal level uh, or a collective level, um, you know, get to where you need to be, um, really benefits from from solid preparation in all areas. Um, during the, uh, the the venture, the expedition, um, one always has to has to bear in mind that the the risk assessment that forms part of the uh, the, the the preparation can change. Uh, it's a dynamic situation. Leaders um, need to be able to react quickly to changing situations. And occupational medicine um, can help uh, guide in, in making sense of of the uh, the, the different um, hazards and and risks identified. But also, I think really importantly, these this day and age. Is the is the post phase? You know, people who may have um, uh, suffered injury, whether it's physical or psychological injury, doing whatever they're doing, um, reintegrating into their their day job, so to speak, unless unless um, um, their mainstream is in the uh, in the wilderness space, it, reintegrating people in into um, where they came from uh, in terms of the, their work, working life is also really important. And sometimes I just get the sense that, that we, we, we don't pay enough attention to that. So I, I, can, I can see what it would be like, say, doing a, a medical for a lorry driver. Um, mm-hmm. Let's say he's got obesity, he's got type 2 diabetes, he's going to be driving long haul with trucks across to mainland Europe. You know, can, you know it's a... Some with pre-existing conditions, that's his environment. But what about an extreme environment? What are the unique considerations? So let's take the example of uh, diving. I think that's a, a great place to start because you know you're, you're sending someone underwater under under pressure, um, and you know lots can go wrong. Puts a lot of strain on our own physiology. What are the unique considerations when you prepare to? to allow someone to enter into that kind of environment? What are the main things that are going through your mind when you're doing, say, a dive medical? Okay, so I think the first thing one needs to, one needs to establish is, is what, 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 what is the, the purpose of, of 
the, the reason uh, for, for this person's diving activity, whether or not it's recreational, um, whether or not uh, it is professional. So you have professional divers or somewhere in between, which is the, uh, the research or the, or, the, or the scientific diving, which is what I was um, mainly involved in, uh, in in my um, in my immediate past past uh, employment. Um, there are standards. Uh, so once you identify what group the individual falls into, uh, one needs to um, identify the uh, the standards that 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 should apply. In diving um, medicine, there are many different standards. They're all variations on a theme, um, but the the the. Um, the thoroughness with which they are applied, uh, the detail of how they're applied differs between organization and, and organization. Um, and if, if one is pressing the quality agenda, and I would always suggest that um, that should always be, be first and foremost in, in, in our rationale, um, not to the extent of, of, of um, regulating uh, to you know, ad infinitum, where really you, there, there is there is very little movement because uh, there's always something that you 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 know depends on how how hard you look. There's always something that you can um, uh, identify that may present an obstacle, but it's using one's experience um, and training uh, against the set of guidelines generally. Um, uh, in, I'm talking about the research, uh, the research environment here, um, and making sure that uh, where where there are um, good reasons for for um, identif- good reasons for uh, making uh, a an unfit uh, um, assessment on somebody uh, is you know it's it's well founded in in um, uh, you know, in, in, in the evidence. And sometimes the evidence is, is a little bit difficult to uh, its origin to, to ascertain. Um, but most of the time it's fairly, uh, it's, it's fairly straightforward and, and accepted. Um, well, Ken, can you give us an example of just a couple of common conditions that you've come across doing dive medicals that have led you to recommend that someone doesn't go ahead and, and dive? What kind of things are commonly come up? Absolutely, and um, so, for instance, uh, in in the research diving uh, area, there there are um, the standards that we used in 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 Jeddah were the uh, American Academy of Underwater Sciences standards for for, for research diving, and they uh, require the individual, um, the diver, to be seen. Uh, assessed by um, a physician of their choice, preferably somebody who is trained in underwater in underwater medicine. Um, and just thinking of, a, of of one of the main reasons why um, we were unable to uh, pass as fit um, a number of a number of our divers was uh, asthma. Um, and it's it's. It, it's it's very um, interesting in this in this day and age of of COVID, uh, whereby um, it was it, we found that we had some divers uh, coming to um, uh, for assessment who hitherto had never had never had a diving medical at all who who had been diving, but hadn't had certainly not had a, a, a diving medical to the standards that. Um, we uh, that the university um, ascribed to, but one of the one of the main problems that we found was uh, in the assessment, uh, the necessary level of assessment that of of uh, divers with a history of asthma, is that we simply couldn't access the the type of of um, uh, assessment, uh, so bronchial provocation tests in 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 one uh, certainly in one area. Um, it was just it was just not it was just impossible to get hold of so we're talking about preparation here and and if one of the recommendations that i made um which was was pretty much all i could do in the situation given that 
to apply the standards that I wanted to apply, we was impossible in where we were working, was to try and get um, these medicals done before people arrived uh, in in country where it may or may not have been um, uh, easier for for them to access this this uh, um, this test. So asthma was a was, was a is it's so common, and there are many divers with asthma, but it's being able to uh, understand the, um, uh, the, the, the individual's um, particular type of asthma, their, their level of control, um, and their understanding of their condition, and, and putting in place mitigations which um, uh, would, make it, would, would make it safe or safer than um, somebody with, without uh, uh, asthma. So that's one very common, um, one very common example, which um, was frustrated by the, the 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 COVID pandemic and the the limited access to certain tests that, that were required to fully yeah. assess. That must have been very difficult. What about ENT problems, Kent? Do they come up a lot? The history yeah, of collaboration, so, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the main um, well one of the um, uh, the problems that we commonly see is people uh, who want to start diving. Um, so uh, these would probably be um, mainly in the recreational area. Uh, is a, an inability to uh, to clear one one's one's ears to perform a valve salva. If you can't do that. Um, then uh, it's going to be really, really difficult to um, to train to d- train safely to dive, and it's it's one of those um, conditions whereby we 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 generally say that it's not it's not a great idea that uh, or diving is probably not for you until uh, we one can one can easily uh, reliably uh, clear clear there is. Of course, there are. Um, Temporary situations where clearing your ears, performing a valve might um, be uh, difficult, upper respiratory tract infections and, and so on. But if somebody who was, um, uh, to all intents and purposes, uh, well, was unable to clear their ears for uh, anatomical reasons, um, then that, that, would, that would prescribe um, their, their fitness. So there are these guidelines that you've mentioned, but you're also, it's all a case by case basis by the sounds of it. So you're making quite a yeah. nuanced judgment in, in each instance. Is that right? Yeah. I, and I, I think there are some absolute contraindications and we've spoken mm. of, of, of um, at least one there. Um, but where, where, there, where it is safe or where there are mitigations, so you might think about limiting depth, you might think about... Um, you know other other mitigations um, that you 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 try your best to screen people in uh, as opposed to screening out as a as a concept, um, but it is um, it is a challenge and 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 I think one needs to be really careful about. Um, uh, knowing at least uh, the you know a, a, a working knowledge of, of diving medicine, if nothing else, to uh, allow you to understand uh, what you don't know, to know what you don't know, I think is yeah. is is really really important. Because if yeah. you recognise that, then you can seek relevant uh, relevant input, um, yeah. and that is that is something that uh, I, I think is a is a is a key a key factor. Um, recognising when you need yeah. need help. So uh, that's really interesting to hear. So you need a knowledge of the condition in hand, and that's where your medical background comes in. But clearly, you also need a knowledge of the environment and the activity that, that person's doing. So, you know, to, to understand what the difference between recreational diving at, say, 18 meters compared to deep diving on different gas mixtures, um, you know, much higher levels of risk, you know, the risk of decompression illness, having to do deco stops, that kind of thing. So, you know, where were you able to, to gain that knowledge of the environment that enabled you to then make those uh, recommendations on what mitigating measures, what depths, et cetera, that, that would make that activity safe? Yeah, so that you know, diving med- diving medicine was one of the um, the, the, uh, the my interest in in diving medicine um, was one of the main reasons I went into to occupational medicine. Um, it, in answer to your question, I think if you are interested in in that environment, well start getting involved in that environment. So start by learning to dive, um, and there are many. Obviously, there are many, many uh, ways that you can do that. Um, but also, if you're developing an interest in in diving medicine, there is a number of really, really 
um, interesting, um, relatively uh, uh, affordable means of developing um, expertise, um, uh, accreditation in, in, in diving medicine. Uh, I was very uh, lucky to have, uh, well, during my time in, in the Royal Navy, to have worked in, a, in the, um, the diving um, medicine uh, division. Uh, so we not only uh, um, delivered uh, uh, diving medicine courses, but we got involved in, um, in, in assessing fitness and treating stricken divers in, in, um, uh, in the, the hyperbaric chambers um, that were at, uh, close to where we were in, 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 um, in Gosport, and then they moved over to, to Chichester. Um, but I was also very lucky recently uh, when, I, when I was in Jeddah to be able to go to uh, Fremantle in, in, um, in, in Western Australia uh, to uh, undergo um, uh, an equivalent course there uh, in, in part to keep on, on top of my, my working knowledge of, of diving medicine, but also to immerse yourself in, in the, you know, continuing professional development, um, uh, in, in that, in that, uh, in that word. And I would really encourage anybody with, uh, an interest in that, in this fascinating, uh, area to take, uh, you know, to, to, to take some steps towards getting accreditation and you, you'd, you'd be surprised, um, about how much you probably already know, um, but how much there is to learn. And um, for me, it 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 just seemed it just seemed a, a really attractive um, uh, area of medicine, slightly different, um, and one in which I, I had a you know several years um, immersed, if you'll excuse the pun, in in that in that world. Um, yeah. And it's something I've tried to take with me where, wherever I've gone. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, so there's, 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 there's lots of lots of resources out there. Um, and, uh, you know, if anybody's interested to just get in touch and I can point them in the right direction uh, for, for training courses. Really, um, we'll right. get um, uh, Kent's contact details at the end. But um, yeah, useful to mention that we, World Extreme Medicine, we do run a dive medicine course in Florida, at the Aquarius Reef Base. So if you're interested, check out the World Extreme Medicine website for more details about that. Let's talk for a moment, Kent, about the remote and offshore world. So this is kind of like the oil and gas industry where we've got workers that are going to be on a, on a, on a rig or a platform somewhere out in the North Sea or you know, even more remote. Uh, are there any key considerations or could you give us any example case studies of the kind of medical conditions that have come out of your screening and any particular dilemmas that you've had in ascertaining their fitness for that kind of work? Yeah, so the, the, um, the I undertook... Um, the oil and gas UK uh, training um, that is now happily delivered delivered online. Um, I did that last uh, last summer, well, late late last summer, in order to provide a means of assessing uh, again our research divers who go who go um, uh, on our liverboard uh, uh, vessels uh, in order to. Um, you know, to to do their research, and although um, oil and gas is essentially an an uh, a means uh, by which one can apply standards to people working in the, in the oil and gas um, uh, uh, fields, um, it was it was the only offshore type medical um, standard um, that uh, civilian standard. Uh, that I um, that that I felt was was appropriate for the type of um, environment our research divers were um, uh, were uh, going to work in, and, and just to give you an example of of some of the areas that were of particular concern to me um, were once once one has assessed one's suitability to dive and 
and and um, everything that goes with the diving medicine side of things. It's one has to think really about um, how is this person going to um, manage in the remote uh, maritime environment and simple things like um, food allergies. Let's let's take that f- for instance. Um, somebody with with a food allergy or um, a history of a food allergy that hasn't been properly assessed, um, didn't really understand um, the the potential implications of that and and uh, the, the 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 dangerous situation that could arise uh, should. Um, there be uncontrolled um, consumption or, or consumption of foods whose provenance you may not, the ingredients of which you may not uh, in, entirely be, be sure of. Um, and uh, mitigating that with, uh, you know, assessment of, of, of a need for uh, immediate medical management, whether it required a, an EpiPen or whether um, uh, anti oral antihistamines were, were going to be sufficient. Um, just, just trying to understand all of that and not just um, in the doctor um, client relationship, uh, patient relationship um, that, that we have in occupational medicine, but also just to trying to look a little bit beyond um, that. And, and uh, occupational medicine is, is about the individual, but it's also about the employer and trying to help the employer help themselves um, do the right thing in terms of um, uh, looking for uh, solid means of, of, of um, extraction in terms of you know med- medical extraction as necessary, and so these all present you know certain challenges. Which, um, given uh, the maritime environment, you know you could be you could be a day or two away from the nearest. Um, uh, you know, secondary care uh, facility or even primary care facility. Um, these are things that you that that one needs to consider. Um, simple um, and generally not much of an issue if if the if if there's a good diag- if if there's a solid diagnosis and there's a solid treatment plan, and people around you know what to do and the organisation knows how to deal with those type of emergencies, and you can you can map that situation to really any situation uh, in, a, in a remote environment what's your what's your plan you know when things you know when, when things go wrong um, and it, it's it's prior preparation uh, will you know prevent disasters or at least will make the disaster less less likely so taking your your great example there Kent of say you've got an individual with a history of true anaphylaxis to peanuts yeah. and you're sending yeah. them off to an environment, a remote maritime environment where they're at least a day or two from definitive care. What you're saying is that it's not a frank no, you know, you, you, you're not eligible for employment in this role. Is it much more nuanced than that, whereby you're, you're really able to modify that risk uh, as much as possible to, to make that acceptable. And that's in consultation with that individual, but also with the employer and, and, and the environment and, and what's available. Is, am I understood that correctly? Yeah, no, you, you have absolutely. And a, a key part of all, um, of all medical uh, contingency plans is, is understanding the, um, it's a risk assessment. So understanding um, or identifying the hazard and, and calculating the risk, uh, identifying who may be at, um, at, at risk and why. Um, and then, uh, you know, what, what are you, what, what is your plan? What do you, what can you do about it? And um, what can you do to, to drive down um, the, the, the risk? Uh, recording it and then revisiting it. Um, just the classic um, risk assessment cycle, which is so important um, to every every medical plan. Um, and as you say, it is nuanced. And um, thinking of the, the situation that we face with this, the, the individual with a history of anaphylaxis is, is was it truly anaphylactic you know where is the the specialist input and and 
sometimes you you can be seen as the bad guy, um, but really what you're doing is protecting the individual uh, and protecting the organization um, in that order, uh, I would always say, uh, or at least trying to, and not being being able to back yourself, I think, is a, is a really important skill. Uh, occupational medicine, expedition medicine can be a lonely task uh, when you're the only person um, making uh, these, these pretty, pretty punchy calls. But make, make no apology, because really what you, you're just, you are doing your job, you are um, uh, introducing a quality, uh, uh, or you're seeing through a, a quality agenda. Um, but always, you know, always be as flexible as you can be, but have your, have your red lines. I, I know exactly how that feels when you're, you feel very exposed in your decision making. It really, the buck stops with you and there's all these different moving parts, all these different conversations yeah. happening around you. And, and you know, the, the people turn to you and they say, well, what are we going to do? And, and you've just got to make a decision and um, move, move things forwards. And I really like the way, uh, certainly the ex- expedition world, the, the risk assessments that I've been part of, I really like the way that you described there about there being two components to that, both the reactive uh, sorry, a proactive component to that where you're anticipating what the risks might be and how you can prevent those things happening in the first place and also a reactive component. So what do you do if this happens? You've, you know, you've got a, a plan in place, you've got the right equipment, you've got the right training, et cetera, um, so that that that, that mitigates uh, any sequelae from, from that event were it to happen. So, uh, yeah, is that how you see things? So kind of a in a risk assessment, a, a proactive and then a reactive component. So there's kind of separate strands. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think one of the roles of, of occupational medicine being um, the specialty a- associated with, with the workplace in whatever format um, that happens to be, is helping, is helping um, those doing the risk assessments, which are, which are you know, to be done well, they're, they're a tricky thing. Um, and just helping um, the, the leaders of expeditions, those those companies responsible for delivering these these risk assessments, which which you know can change um, over time, helping them make sense of um, this hazard. You know, what are the what are the potential um, uh, medical sequelae from being exposed to noise or extreme heat, extreme cold? You know, what 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 are you looking for? What are you trying to um, prevent? And one of the one of the key messages that I try and, um, uh, and and get across is, if you ask the right questions, you're going to get the right answers, um, and it's helping organisations know what questions they need to ask, um, and not just going off a picking list, uh, not not just trying to uh, be too formulaic about things. Understand what it is, why you're doing this. Understand uh, the, the risks, the, 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 you know, they will be most, um, uh, the best people to identify the hazards, but could also do with um, uh, help in identifying uh, uh, unseen hazards or, or uh, un, uh, hazards that haven't been thought about particularly, and then calculating calculating the risk and and then making sense of that um, uh, of, of of the matrix of of hazard and, and risk and and coming up with a, a set of priorities and and understanding that you know sometimes you cannot reduce the risk um beyond uh you know the the uh what what is straightforward uh and to a large degree that is you know risk is is why is part and parcel of of some of these uh more testing um uh, expeditions more testing environments and you know great that that's how it should be but it's understanding that risk and doing everything that you can to drive down that risk to make sure that um, through your preparation, uh, your your mitigation, your your professional understanding of the environment that you're working in, um, is going to make a success of, of everything, and it needn't be obstructive. Um, it's 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 facilitative, um, and it is it is trying to 
to optimize uh, your your stated objectives, whatever they whatever they might be, and and this is particularly true, I think, of of situations where there may not be immediate access to professional um, medical or health support, and you know there are many expeditions who who uh, you know don't for one reason or another have uh, a professional uh, medic working uh, alongside them. Um, so it's in those situations where identifying the hazards. You know, just going through the the, the, the risk process, the, the risk the assessment process, is so key, and 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 dealing with uncertainty, um, dealing with, you know, the lack of 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 evidence in 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 some areas is also um, something that we that we really need to uh, to to or well, that occupational health can can really help with, um, and 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 that. That's the thing that excites me. That's the thing where I think um, working alongside um, supporting expedition um, medics, because they are the people who are going to be dealing with this in the field, supporting in the pre the, the pre the pre phase, um, being in there in the background during the expedition, and really helping in the post phase, um, thinking about things that may not have been thought about before optimizing um i've used that word probably far too many times in this in this last half an hour or so but that's what it's about it's 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 optimization of 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 people and yes. the situation and what you can gain from it and i think ocmed yeah. with the particular skills that that we are used to dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. has a lot to add I think that's a huge reframe for me, Kent, this idea of you being that, that, that word optimization and being facilitative and not mm. obstructive, you know, not being the policeman, not being the bad guy, uh, you know, being a barrier to entry for some of these incredible experiences that, that our, you know, clients and participants want to be part of. Nevertheless, I think that, that there's a huge perception of us uh, medics that are do kind of pre-deployment medicals that we are going to um, put the brakes on long held ambitions and dreams. And there's this huge issue so that I've experienced. I'm interested to hear your, your experience and views on this, of the issue of non-disclosure where people just don't quite give you the full picture. They perhaps try and brush things under the carpet or downplay certain aspects of their medical history that only really come to light later down the line, actually on the trip itself when it's too late to really do anything about it. Tell us a bit about your experience of non-disclosure in expeditions and other extreme environments. Well, uh, it's, it's such an important um, point to, to raise. Well, I think the fact that to, to start off with, we have to accept that it's always going to be it's always going to be like that, um, and uh, it is um, something that we that we have to deal with. Um, I think it's all to do with understanding. Um, the uh, why are we asking these questions, um, and uh, what is what is the purpose of this? And I think if people understand, if if you're separating out the occupational medicine and the primary and and the, the expedition medicine, then if you are able to impress upon somebody why we need to know this, it may be relevant, it may not be relevant, but be safe telling us this information then we can we can make sense of um we 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 hopefully will be able to encourage um that individual to share that information and we can turn that into um uh, a function uh, uh, we can we can look at the functionality and that's what it's all about are you able to function in this environment is it safe for you to function in this environment and then um you're always going to have situations where people will still uh, not disclose. Um, but I, th I think given, given the, the, that we often come across this uh, in, in occupational medicine, I think it is, it is, it is something that we may be able to uh, help uh, expedition medics tease out and, and explain why we need to know this um, and, and turn medical histories into functional um uh, uh functional capabilities on the ground and and uh, and try and impress upon people that actually um this is not always something to be 
to be worried about screen yeah. people in yeah but accept at the same time that yeah sometimes it is not a good thing for you to do this and and explain yeah. the reasons why because the standard capture tool that the screening tool that's used across the board is the the health questionnaire isn't it uh you know, yeah and it's so easy to you know it's a lot very much a box ticking exercise do you have history of epilepsy heart disease high blood pressure etc so easy to um to just not tick the correct box uh, or just not is there a better way do you think that we could we could pick up on, on some really important medical comorbidities than the health questionnaire is is that still fit for purpose in this modern way in modern age or is, is is that just the way things need to be done i mean if you if you take a, an off the shelf medical questionnaire um there will be questions in there which are probably completely completely irrelevant um wh why do you need to know um if uh Okay, let me let me let me let me think of a question here. In in some question, some medical questionnaires that I've come across in the past have asked, you know, what what color are your eyes? Or um, I I can't see that that's of any any relevance at all. Um, or ask will ask questions that are people don't quite understand. So they will ask questions that that the medical um, professionals will understand, but, but others may not. So, you know, for instance, um, you know, have you uh, ever had, uh, you know, any very dark colored stools, you know, and, and leave it at that. What, what, what people need to understand the, the rationale for these, these questions. And, and one can take a, 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 a lesson from, um, from pre-employment questionnaires where safety may not be uh, or, or safety critical functionality may not be a particular interest and you just have to ask you know are are you um uh ask us questions that are specific and justifiable and there is a lot of you know legal um uh uh, uh precedent in this area but we're generally talking about people who are not who are not going to be employed uh on on an expedition although of course the expedition um uh you know there will be some people employed on that expedition no no doubt um so yeah what what a don't ask a question if you don't know what to do with the uh, with the answer b try and ask questions for which there are um standards and if if there aren't standards then there have to be um you know other good reasons for for asking that question or, or a, a body of of consensus and if there is neither um uh neither of those things well then i i, I the the um the utility of that question is probably of of, of very little of, you know it was very little yeah. so having the right experience, having the right um, training, um, knowing the environment um, will help you make sense of, of, the, of the, the fitness assessments. And, and that's where I think um, the, the uh, medics who are uh, involved in, in expedition medicine um, will over time develop a huge um, bank of knowledge um, but there's always something I think there's, there's, we, we, we're always learning, aren't we? Lifelong learning. And there's always something, a different angle, a different approach, a different formula that you can apply um, from from occupational medicine that helps you tease out the, the salient issues. Um, ask questions for a reason. Um, be able to do something with the answers. Um, map the individual to the task or the task to the individual, if that's possible. Um, sometimes it isn't, except that there are, you know, irreducible um, minima uh, in terms of what you can do. And there's always going to be a degree of risk, but everybody understanding their role, everybody understanding um, what they're getting into and having, having faith and trust in the people who are, who are um, assessing them, I think is a, is a really key role. And, this, as I you know, said before, is where occupational medicine can support, not supplant the, the expedition medicine um, professionals, people who are deploying. Um, and I, I, I see that as a very happy, happy marriage. And I, I'm sure there are many you know, occupational medicine physicians with experience 
um, or or I have to say, n- numerous, many, in fact, probably every military primary care physician, uh, of whatever flavor, Army, Navy, um, or, or the or the Air Force, will have have uh, a, a deep understanding of of occupational medicine um, aspects of, in the general sense or in the specialist sense. And we've spoken about diving, aviation, thermal, you know, and so on. Yeah, we've looked at examples of um, uh, asthma as a pre-existing condition of anaphylaxis. What yeah. about mental health? Um, someone with a previous history of psychosis or depressive disorder. What role do you think that plays in someone's uh, fitness for an extreme environment? How how much risk does that confer, uh, and how do you how do you mitigate that 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 kind of um, background on, on a pre pre deployment? screening okay so i mean again that's a that is a huge issue and mental health you know we're, we're lucky to get to to go through our lives without without having some uh, as all of us without having some um brush with um with with significant mental mental health issues and you know let, let's accept that 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 is that is just the way it is and um but we're getting much much better at recognizing and and, and dealing and dealing with it but it it all goes down to you know why why does one need to know um what what are the issues um and this is where occupational medicine as the at the in the as a at the nexus of of all the all the specialties can draw in specialist reports and make sense of those reports um, mapping the individual and their condition or their past condition to to the environment and and often we find uh, and i was just reading in um uh, bs 8848 or a summary a summary of it that often one one expedition medics write to um, GPs or to specialists, whether it's psychiatrists or surgeons, or um, and and ask them whether or not they feel an individual is fit for this for for this expedition or this role. But it does recognise that um, they may not be the best people to 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 give to give this advice. And certainly, when when I was in the military, we we had real challenges sometimes in um managing expectations of individuals who were who were who were given the all clear um by a well-meaning um surgical specialist a civilian surgical specialist or a physician only to to have to um manage expectations downwards where where the that functionality or lack of functionality would not suit suit the environment so looking looking at mental health given any it would be on a case by case basis and not not everybody it's not it's not it's not a big deal um for most people um there are of course um you know important and serious situations that need really careful management but again this is this is where i ident- asking the right questions and i you know getting to the um the nub of the of the of the clinical situation and and again i've said this before screening people in rather than screening them out but not a, you know n- not in every situation and it's it's the skill of the expedition medic or the the occupational physician in in helping the the organization ask the right questions and you can make sense of the um the risk assessment and then draw up recommendations and it would only ever be recommendations um to help the uh the people making decisions uh, as to whether or not this was a, a a risk that was palatable both for the individual most importantly but also then for the expedition um as a whole in terms of outputs but also to other members of the expedition for whom um you know injury or illness can be very distressing um and uh, and you know can can cause um significant disruption which um if it's avoidable um then that's 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 you know something that we should be carefully considered so uh, you mentioned the bs8848 standards there kent and for, for yeah. listeners that haven't come across this before this was a, a set of industry standards agreed back in 2007 for operators of adventurous activities 
uh, to adhere to and, and they could uh, uh, willing they could they could sign up to these standards and it, it bench, benchmarks the degree of safety a degree of prior planning and preparation um, uh, so useful to look out for if you're involved in any organizations if they've got BSA tape for eight accreditation um, interestingly, uh, at that eight, it's called 8848 because that's the height of Everest or was. Everest has since grown by one metre. I believe it's now 8849 oh. metres. So maybe they need I'm an update. Today. I'm out of today. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Ken, we, we've, we've focused on, on this episode very much about the uh, individuals, their medical conditions, the, the conversation that we have pre-departure but your role as an occupational health physician is much more holistic than that and you're involved often throughout the that individual's journey both during deployment and also afterwards and there's a great phrase from the army sorry from the military which says join well train well live well work well and leave well which is a nod to that very kind of holistic approach can you just tell us what that means to you well, this this was um, a this uh, th- those those phrases um, appeared in, I think it was the the Army Health Report 2015 2016, and um, the all the credit goes to a public health um, colleague of mine um, who who uh, came up with 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 that that framework and really um, one can apply this to expeditions um one could apply this to to people joining any type of organization but the 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 military um was absolutely tried its level best to make sure that um people uh joined well and at the end of their careers they left well and and everything in in between and the joining well piece was you know make sure that um we select the the right people. So on an expedition, you select the right the right people for the um, for, for the task. Um, you know, in 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 every regard, um, and then training well. So make sure that people train well. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of being able to deliver uh, the. Uh, outputs, um, optimize their physical fitness, mental fitness, you know, get ready to hit the ground running um, when, uh, when when the expedition uh, commences. Um, then there's working well, so making sure that uh, you have all the skills uh, and competencies necessary to deliver expedition outputs. Uh, live well, it's not all about work, it's about, uh, you know, uh, living with people and enjoying uh, the experience uh, of of the expedition, and and, um, and then you know all all good things come to an end, and it's it's leaving well, and it's that that part um, that I, I I must say my experience with the military was that there, there was such an emphasis on making sure that people uh, left in in an optimal um, condition, both medically uh, in terms of empo- employment prospects um, and, and so on. Uh, and I think there could perhaps be greater emphasis on this uh, in 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 industry. You know, people leaving organisations, um, people leaving expeditions. You know, what are they going back to? Have they uh, sustained uh, you know an injury that might impact on their f- future employability? And and if so, how do we recognise that? And what can we do to um, mitigate that in a timely fashion. So I'm thinking, for instance, you know, um, somebody who relied on their digital dexterity uh, uh, for, for part of their for, for their employment was exposed to you know non-freezing cold injury or even freezing cold injury um, as part of their their you know expedition role. You know, what are you going to do? For, the, for that person where do you send that person is it within the gift uh, within the 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 knowledge base of of um a, uh, a a general practitioner to to know to either diagnose or know you know where it is that they can go to um to to optimize the the um treatment and outcomes for that for that individual um you know so a part of this offboarding or this you know leaving well um i i I think the the expedition guides that i've seen so far are very much um pretty uh pretty generic um 
you know, go and see your GP if A, B or C happens. And if more than one or two people have A, B and C, then everybody should be screened. I, I think one needs to be more um, targeted about this and looking at um, uh, the the hazards and the risks uh, or that, that people have been exposed to on their expedition and target the screening uh, as people um, uh, exit the the that that environment uh, and i i think we we can finesse that we can we can you know add add a, a a layer of um completeness to that in some situations that you know hitherto may not have may not have um been um given you know sufficient um uh, yeah. attention you know, i completely agree Ken. i think a, a lot of energy and emphasis is placed on that pre-departure phase and everyone's getting their kit ready and their sponsorship lined up and uh, mm -hmm. the, the, but the biggest neglected area for me is that w when people return and especially if it's a longer deployment you know how they then reintegrate into yeah. normal society both in their personal and professional sense you know i've been away six months in in central america and i've been away to myanmar for six months and you know, each time I remember you know, coming home was actually a real challenge and I hadn't really anticipated some of the difficulties I would have just in terms of that complete change in your, uh, in your, 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 uh, your routines and, uh, and where you draw your energy from and, um, you know, it can have a huge impact on your mood as well, can't it? And, and perhaps yeah. that's something you're going through now. You've just been out in, in, in Saudi Arabia for two years. You've just come back to Sussex. You know, are you feeling that a little bit yourself, that, that transition, that adjustment? Well, my wife is certainly feeling uh, feeling that adjustment. I think she was quite happy with me being away, um, but uh, <laughs> happy. <laughs> but it, it's it's very true. And again, taking taking a leaf out of the military's book, there, you know, tough tough um, operational tours. So there was always a period of, mm. you know, uh, in barrack, uh, you know, decompression where people just slowly reintegrated um, back into you know normal barrack routine and i'm not suggesting that you know should be the case in every situation but i think it it bears it it, it bears it, you know one one needs to consider it um and particularly if it's been a it's been a tough time or if there's been um tragedy or there's yeah. been you know frightening situations um uh, you know that 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 there should be uh, a comprehensive but light touch um uh assessment uh you know that that just possibly gives people a, a framework a um uh, a structure to uh reference if if they need to but but also you know um again i i, I said just before a targeted a targeted approach um it can be very difficult to 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 reintegrate um and, and people go on expeditions for all sorts of reasons, you know, around the world, uh, sailing, um, uh, in, in, you know, trips and, uh, you know, why, why are people going, you know, what, 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 what is it that they, they hope to gain or what is it that they, they are um, taking themselves away from perhaps, you know, Quite, all these yeah, I've definitely seen that where people have perhaps run away from a situation that's then it's not gone anywhere. They've come back to it and, and they're finally having to face up to it. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it's, it's an opportunity, it's an opportunity as well to identify um, in a non-intrusive way. And I think Ahmed, a, a, you know, this is, this is what we do is, it, is just asking in terms of the occupational um, uh, environment, as opposed to, you know, what GPs are excellent at, what physicians are, you know, it's 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 asking the right questions of that individual to try and tease out um, specific, uh, you know, conditions or, or situations that one can one one can um, address early, uh, and timeliness is really important. Um, I, I recall as a sort of slight sort of uh, segue here, when I was a junior doctor, we um, uh, we used to uh, operate, I, I helped very, you know, very uh, sort of peripherally in what we called the, the FIPO clinics, the Far Eastern Prison of War clinics. And we saw guys come back from places like Burma, as it was called then, um, from, you know, places in the Far East where they were incarcerated during the Second War. 
and w had suffered a lifetime of, of ill effects simply because um, either at the time it, it wasn't there weren't the means to uh, screen or there weren't the means to identify uh, or even recognize that, you know, the long-term effects of, of some of the conditions that they contracted when they were out there. And, and it just struck me at, at that, that there was a huge benefit um, for a, a good number of the, the FIPOs, um, wonderful, you know, long suffering by definition um, group, you know, and some had, had absolutely, you know, nothing to to identify but there were a good number of people who who um met with with benefit from from attending these clinics and you know screening has has to you know has to you don't screen for any reason there have to be certain criteria met and won't go into all of those i'm not sure i can remember all of those but it, it is there is a value to all of this and um I, th I think the, the post-expedition phase is an opportunity. Um, it certainly isn't a threat. Nobody should regard it as a threat. Um, but I think it is, it is something that um, perhaps we could, you know, we could um, brush up a little bit on. Well, Kent, I've learned a huge amount from talking to you. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I think the, the big things I've taken away, this idea of asking the right questions is so important, isn't it? And uh, being, a, being being comfortable with uncertainty and risk and it is never a black and white answer. I think as medics, we're in a great place to deal with that, the, the, the nuance that comes with this kind of work. Um, yeah. And the, of course, the seven, the seven golden P's that you've alluded to, you know, it's you know, prior preparation prevents piss poor performance all of that you know that that's that just uh, is is really key in, in this whole game isn't it yeah absolutely absolutely it's all in the yeah. preparation and yeah uh, the more time you spend uh with that the easier time you can expect um more time to focus on the fun things yeah that's right that's it and it's we're you know we're enablers we're facilitators we're not policemen uh that's that's a key message as well so yeah thanks so much kent for your time today don't forget everyone the world extreme medicine conference is happening um on the 15th 13th to the 15th of november this year tickets are flying off the shelves like hotcakes so make sure you get yours soon if you want to hear lots more content like this uh, lots more guests like kent from from today who've worked in expedition military disaster humanitarian space aviation uh, from across the board uh that's the place to be this november at dynamic earth in edinburgh or online so big final thank you to kent if you want to reach out to him the the place to go is linkedin he's very active on there you can ping him a message and he'd be more than happy to um to chat to you so thank you kent my pleasure Real thank pleasure. you to those of you listening stay extreme <laughs>